Well, let's go back through really quick some of the uh, slides we looked at last week, and then we'll move on to new ones. And uh, to give folks the idea of some kind of the, the, the distribution of some of these great meltwater ponds that formed, there we go. All right, you see Hudson Bay up there. Now, this is showing the maximum extent of, of the meltwater. You'll see that this, all of this big old mass, I mean, this is like Agassiz here. I mean, look at this compared to the size of the Great Lakes. Now, if anybody or listener has been, lives up around the Great Lakes or has visited, you know, the Great Lakes, you know, they, they, they earned their, deserve their name, the Great Lakes. But now look at Lake Agassiz. I mean, you know, when you stand on the shore of, of any of the Great Lakes, you're looking out, you don't see the other side. You're just seeing an, un, you know, an endless body of water. Now look at Lake Agassiz. I mean, that's a huge amount of water. Yeah, that's, that's like an inland sea. Probably. That is like that's an huge. inland sea. Yeah. And, of course, it's fresh water. Now, and, and yes, enormous. this is a transitional phase that we're looking at here. And if we come down to, let's see here. Uh, well, yeah, right here, you see this, you see Winnipeg, and then you come straight down to this southernmost extension of Lake Agassiz. This was one of the discharge points right here. And that fed into the upper uh, Mississippi watershed via the Minnesota River. And I told the story of how uh, the, the, the River Warren, which was the glacial meltwater flow that came down through what is now the Minnesota River, um, was the thing that way back in 1969, when I was standing on the bluffs, the 200-foot high bluffs, looking down at the modern Minnesota River, channel in its little channel with its own little bluffs on each side, and then I saw three miles away another set of bluffs. That was the, my first intimation of the idea of scale and variance. And I went away from there with this thought in my mind that was this just a bigger version of that down there, that little river down there in the Minnesota River isn't a tiny river by any means. Um, but that stuck with me. It always stuck with me. And then, of course, I never really acted on it. or It was just a thought, like, okay. And then I quickly forgot about it. But I came back to it. Things would remind me of it, you know. So, there was a whole succession of things over the next decade that finally led me around to like going, okay, there's a story here. You know, we go, uh, I travel out and the, the next summer and I go down through the Columbia Gorge and I see all of these gigantic fans splayed out from the tributary valleys. And see, the thing was, is that on an unconscious level, I recognized what I was looking at because I'd walked as a kid, you know, living in rural Minnesota, I had walked along many, many creeks and rivers and had seen that exact thing, that the, 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 the fans splayed out from the mouths of tributaries coming into creeks and rivers. I had seen that, but it had never really registered. I didn't think about it. I mean, people walk along and they see this stuff all the time and you don't really think about it. Like going, oh, let's see. Well, there's a, there's a fan splayed out this is sediment being carried by this tributary. It comes into this gravel bar, sandbar here, and it builds this. You don't really think about that unless you're a geologist or a geomorphologist. That, I think, is what distinguishes the geologist is that's the person that looks at these things and thinks about them and wonders about how they were created. But my point is, is I had walked along many rivers and, and uh, creek, you know, uh, sandbars, point bars, and everything along creeks and had seen those features where the splayed out fan might be three, four, five feet wide, an inch thick, you know, and it's coming out. And you can very clearly see it coming out from, uh, you know, you might be having a creek that might be, let's say the creek is 20 feet wide and you've got a smaller creek coming in from the side. And so it's discharging right there where there might be a point bar. So it's building this fan. Well, when I went through the Columbia Gorge in 1970, I was seeing those formations, but on this massive mega scale, and I, it just didn't register what I was looking at, but it was on consciously that is subconsciously. I think I I kind of saw what I was looking at, but it was just the, the the scales were so disparate. I wasn't making it a connection. It wasn't until years later that I, you know, after I started reading Bretts and and um, looking at and learning more about geomorphology and seeing aerial photographs and and all of this that I go, oh wow, this is a scale invariant phenomena. 
And I've got pictures and I'll try to gather some for one of the next coming up episodes where I take pictures all the time when I walk along creeks and rivers because they're like living natural hydrological laboratories. And you go to a sandbar, you can see recreated all of the forms and, and, and things that you see on a mega scale in terms of these mega floods. Because that's the thing about water erosion and deposition is that you can have a cataract created by water that's 400 feet high and five miles wide, or you can have one that's an inch high and a foot wide. But the, the morphology is, this, is basically the same because the principles are the same. It's the way water moves. It all comes down to the movement of water and what water can do as it's moving over the earth because it sculpts the earth. So going back to this image here, you can see the, 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 the vast extent of some of these meltwater pools that accumulate against the receding ice. Then if you also think about how the land is rising, what's happening is the land is rising as the water is now spilling over the divides because the water is ultimately, it's all trying to, it's using gravity, but it's all trying to get back to the main body of water and rejoin the ocean. We want to get back to the ocean. We want to get back and be part of the big amorphous body of water that's a, a, really a continuum around the entire planet, right? Unless it gets uh, temporarily sequestered in the form of, of glacial ice or, you know, groundwater on the continents. But even groundwater, it's ultimately everything's trying to get back to the ocean basins. And so... So is that is that Hind just to the left of Winnipeg there? This is would that... be Hind... Right okay, in yeah. here. Yes. Look, see, here would be Lake Regina or Regina. I think it's Regina. Um, but actually, this is like a, I don't think Lake Hind was ever this full extent. The maps that I've seen of, of Lake Hind, they vary somewhat. Because I think some of those shorelines that they're, that they're tracing might get kind of amorphous in places. But anyways, yes, Lake Hind would have been right in here. And then this would have been that connection back to, yeah. to Agassiz. And these arrows represent flows out. So in other words, you've got to see these arrows, they're flowing back. So one of the theories, as I mentioned earlier, was you had a shift in the major discharge of Lake Agassiz into the upper Mississippi watershed. It shifted east. And then you'll see here flowing out this way up through the St. Lawrence Seaway and into the North Atlantic. So this goes back to Wally Brecker and some of his, his colleagues that theorized that it was this massive, this massive influx, this massive flowing of Lake Agassiz back into the North Atlantic that caused the shutdown of the meridional overturning circulation, the MOC. And it's easier to say MOC than meridional overturning circulation. So we'll call it the MOC. So it interrupted the MOC. And because it interrupted the MOC, it, it temporarily uh, uh, interrupted the, the the transference of heat from the towards the equator and the lower latitudes towards northern Europe. Problem was gets into the timing of that, um, and we can get into talking about that somewhat. Why it perhaps is is the idea doesn't curry the same favor it did a decade or two ago. Um, what what other routes are there? to the North Atlantic other than the St. Lawrence Seaway. I don't see that that much is connecting to St. Lawrence. Is it going out through yes, up into all, the Arctic Ocean? Well, yeah, uh, there, yes, there, there is, yes. That, that's become apparent now from studies of the McKenzie River Delta and, and scab, there's a whole set of scab lands and erosional features up where the McKenzie River flows into the Arctic. And we're gonna be, we're gonna be moving up there. We're going to be All looking right. at maps and stuff. So that's, yeah, that's that's the third outlet, a northern outlet into the Arctic Ocean. Yeah. And and that may have contributed to, you know, causing a rapid cooling of the North Atlantic. But yeah, all of these arrows here are showing meltwater pathways. So look, you see, you've got this pathway coming right here. Now check this out. There's Lake Nipigon right there, yep. right under that arrow. And it's showing that there's a massive flood. And this flooding right here, has been dated right to right at the Younger Dryas boundary. So it's coming out this way, and you see the arrows coming here. So you've got this, and then you've got some water coming over here. Interesting, we'll come down and look at this, right where this arrow is. That's Grand Valley, Michigan. So it's a huge spillway right in here. And then 
check this out down here coming out of Chicago down here. Look at this, Brad. This is where oh, we yeah. visited. This is where the Kankakee Torrent would have been. For and sure. all that erosion, that really interesting and bizarre erosion that we saw there along the Illinois River. That mm -hmm. was right here. I see it. Yeah, I know. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And then right here, notice this arrow. Well, that arrow is the St. Croix. That's yeah. where we took Graham on the last day. We took, went out to the great potholes. And those potholes are in a, a constriction within the St. Croix River Valley where it comes between uh, layers of hard basalt. And as that water comes focusing into that constriction, it has to speed up. It's the same idea of the conservation of energy. So as that water is coming through the constriction, at any given point past a, a measuring device like a wear, the volume of water passing there is the same along the run uh, of, the, of the current flow, right? But if you've got a wide channel that, that where your cross-sectional capacity is much greater, it's going to be slower, right? But then you get up to a constriction. So now, the, since the same amount of water, the same volume of water is passing any point in the constriction or in the basin, the thing is in the constriction, though, the water has to be flowing much faster in order that the same equivalent volume of water is passing a point within the constriction as it is a point within the basin. And this is an important property that you have to kind of get in your mind to understand this geomorphic alphabet, this geomorphic grammar, if you will, uh, is because, you see, in a, in a flow like this, you're going to have natural constrictions, you're going to have natural basins. So anywhere where there's a constriction, you're going to have flow acceleration, and then you're going to have, that's going to tend to be erosive. Then if you have a basin where the water flow spreads out, that's going to be a um, depositional basin. And typically, what you'll always see is, is the same is that when it begins to deposit its material, it deposits the large material first, the clasts, if you want to use that term. It deposits the large material first, and then as the water is slowing down, the, 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 it, there's a, a grading, a sorting of the material from coarse to fine. And that coarse to fine is a paleocurrent indicator. Right, Kyle? Yes, sir. A paleocurrent yeah. indicator. So we're learning about paleocurrent indicators so that when we go out in the field, we see a paleocurrent indicator and we go, oh, yes, the flood came from that way and it went that way. Right? Because yep, like what we're doing is when we're seeing the evidence for these big old current flows out in the field where there's little or no water flowing now, the question is where ultimately did this flood start? If you've got, say, a reservoir of water in the case of like the Teton Dam failure in 1976, the dam fails, you've got this big flood that comes down and it completely changes the landscape um, within its pathway so that the that the post-flood landscape is very distinctly different from the pre-flood landscape. but and, and you can go throughout that area, down current from where the dam failed, and you'll find paleocurrent indicators, a bunch of different kinds of paleocurrent indicators. But if you raise the question and say, well, ultimately, where did this flood start? Well, you can go right up there and you can identify the reservoir. And so... When we talk about, we, we mentioned this last time, when we talked about Lake Missoula, well, the assumption is, oh, okay, well, look, we see all this erosion in the eastern Washington along the, the Columbia Basalt Plateau caused by these great floods. Well, there's no big floods happening there now, but so they happened, they're over with, and they created this landscape that you see now. Where did the floods come from? Oh, well, they came from Lake Missoula. End of discussion, right? Well, then I come along and I go, well, wait a second. You're talking about Lake Missoula. You're talking about, over 600 cubic miles of water. Where did that come from? That had to have come from somewhere. And that's where we get, I think, that the whole, pro, the whole m model of glacial ice dam and, and uh, glacially impounded lake begins to, to come apart because, you know, you're faced with, you're faced with this question. That, that's a very huge volume of water. I, I mean, it's almost filled the entire watershed. So you're up to first order streams feeding this massive lake. How is that even possible? First order streams are the highest. When you look at, at, at the, the, the hierarchical ranking of creeks and rivers, say in North America, number one is the smallest 
you can have. There's there's nothing feeding into it. It usually is starting from an ephemeral creek that only starts when it rains or it's coming from a spring, right? So you've got the first order, it comes in, and then it meets another, another creek comes into it, or it meets another creek, and now you've got an enlarged creek, and that becomes a second order. And likewise, you can go right through the ranking. And when you get to the biggest river system in the North American continent, with the biggest watershed, with the largest network of tributaries is the Mississippi. And Mississippi, I think, is order 12. You look at Lake, and now you look at, at, at any of the Great Lakes, and you start going, well, none of, none of the, there's no Great Lakes on Earth today being fed by only by first order streams. Because for one thing, then evaporation far outpaces accumulation of water. However, somehow Lake Missoula is defying that that process because you've got first order streams that are literally within a few miles of the whole of the watershed divide, right? You come onto the western shore of Lake Missoula, right in the Bitterroot Mountains, you're right up there almost to the top of the mountains. It goes up another four or five hundred feet, boom, and you're spilling over the tops of the range, right? So you got to think about the rainfall falling. If you look at the ratio of catchment basin to lake, there's a considerable disparity. In other words, your your collection area has to be pretty significant significant to create a great lake, unless you're looking at an exceptional event like we are here with this rapid melting of the ice sheet. But somehow Lake Missoula managed to accumulate 600 plus cubic miles of water. And then where could it, it could have only been meltwater or precipitation. And then it did that like 40 or 70 or 90 yeah, times. Yeah. <laughs> How is that even possible? Yeah. How is that even possible? How is it possible? Because assume it's meltwater. Well, if it's meltwater, that means the glaciers are receding, substantially receding in order to yield up that volume of water. Assuming normal glacial recession, which always proceeds marginally, right? Although in this case, and what we're looking at here, the, 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 these floods of meltwater did not really start marginally in many cases. They seem to have had melting epicenters well removed from the glacier margins. So, you know, this is the question that we're going to really be getting into when we start looking in depth at the Missoula. And what we're going to do is we're going to work our way around the continent, looking at these great flood features as they're distributed over the North American continent. So, so is it possible that Lake Agassiz may have actually looked like that with ice to the south of it? If there was, if impacts caused the melting, right? There, it could have actually looked somewhat like this picture where the, there's this gigantic meltwater lake with ice south of the water. Is that possible? Well, here's the thing. There probably was ice but it was most likely stagnant ice. That is okay. de dead ice. Right. And, and this is something we're going to, again, explore in, in detail because there seems to be in a, very, a, a major transition in the ice between living glacial ice and stagnant dead ice in the aftermath of something, right? Because as we talked about, glaciers are, I think of them as alive. They're accumulating. They're, they're like slow-moving rivers. But they're in, they're an integrated mass of ice that's flowing along, right, coming down, and as it accumulates in the in, in the zone of accumulation, then it's ablating in the or melting away in the zone of ablation. Typically, there's always a slight fluctuation, but there will be a period of time where you're more or less in balance. Sometimes it'll be shrinking back. Sometimes it'll be coming forward. When we go back to the, young, the, the Little Ice Age, say between 1400 and 1800, what we find is that many of the glaciers around the globe grew to the largest extent they had been since the end of the Great Ice Age. So we are literally coming out of a period of, and it's, and it's rightfully called the Little Ice Age, right? And we know this because we can see the moraines, the terminal moraines left by the Great Ice Sheets when mountain valley glaciers come down and they create the moorings, the, 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 the arcuate, say if it's a terminal mooring, it tends to be arcuate because you have the glacial lobe tends to be tongue-shaped, right? And the, the terminal mooring is the material that's been essentially shoveled up or conveyed through the ice and dumped at the, at the mouth of, of the glacier. 
So then when the glacier begins to recede back, it leaves this very distinctive pile of glacial till or rubble, right? So we can see the little ice age moraines and we can see the big ice age moraines. And the little ice age moraines were the biggest ones in pretty much 12,000 years. So, so it was little because it was short, not because it was less ice, basically. No, there was less ice, way less ice, because, but it was still more ice than there had been throughout the entire Holocene. But see, that's what, that's what makes the Holocene so distinct from the, play, the end Pleistocene, is that at the end of the Pleistocene, you had double the amount of ice on the Earth than, than there is now. That's why sea level was 400 and some feet lower, see? But the point is, is that, you know, when the ice is coming, melting back, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pool water just like you see here, right? The, what to me is not known is the ultimately what triggered this, you see? And that's where the, the impact hypothesis gets so interesting as a, as a possibility, as a candidate for, for triggering. The other is solar activity. And I think it could be some combination of both. And we're going to get into that, why I, why I think that an influx of extraterrestrial material into Earth-crossing orbits may also affect the, um, this, the uh, activity of the sun. So that's where I'm, I think that it could be fruitful to look at the 11.6 or the 14.6 uh, 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 melting events. Because to my knowledge at this point, as we've iterated and reiterated, we don't yet have identifiable impact proxies at those horizons. So right down here, this is where this bottom arrow is. This is meltwater draining from Lake Agassiz into the Minnesota River system, right? And right at that mouth, there's a lake at present called Big Stone Lake. Can I jump back for a minute, Randall, just to complete yeah. a thought there before you share some of the pictures? Um, maybe, maybe you skipped it on purpose, but uh, Russ commented about the, the lake refilling 40, 50, 60, 70, 90 times, right? Yeah. And, you were, and, and we're talking about a five to 600 cubic mile lake. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're asking where is all that water coming from? So if it's rapid glacial melt to fill that lake, the other part of that problem is how is that going to have an ice dam or a lobe of the glacier advance down the Clark Fork River and block that valley to build up the lake? So that's the second part of the problem with there being 70, 80, 90 floods to back up that much uh, lake water. If it's melting, it's, it's warming, and that lobe is not going to block off that river valley repeatedly. that's precisely it brad that, exactly yeah. did, did, it did could have been dammed up the first time but then after that yes yes and i think yes again i think that there was a dam there temporarily and the water backed up against the dam temporarily but somewhere once that water the water in the clark fork valley and throughout the entire basin had to get to four thousand two hundred feet above sea level so that is a phenomenal. I mean, when you're in the Clark Fork Valley and you're looking at that that 4200 ASL, and you're at 2,000 feet above sea level, you're looking at something that's 2,000 feet over your head, and to trying to, to visualize how the hell that much water got in there, right? It's problematic. And what Brad was just saying is, well, isn't that a contradiction? Well, if it's melt water, that means that the ice is melting back, right? How are you? And, and again, the pressures produced by a hydraulic head of 2,100 feet are incredible. There's no known example in modern times of ice dammed lakes even coming close to those kinds of pressures. And see, we've got a good example to, to, to learn from because again, going back to what I said, the little ice age, the, the glaciers got bigger than they'd been in 10, 11, 12,000 years. So now 150 years ago, 170 years ago, they start shrinking back. Well, as they shrink back, they're creating proglacial lakes. So throughout the early 19th century, we had an increased number of glacial outburst floods, which is actually diminishing as time goes on because as the glaciers shrink, the amount of the volume of meltwater being contributed uh, is diminishing. And the ability of the ice to form these temporary ice dams is, is diminishing. In other words, 
you know, a hundred years ago, you might have had a, tr- a, a, a tributary valley blocked off by a, a trunk glacier, right? In the main valley, you've got a big trunk glacier. Okay, but what happens once that trunk glacier recedes above the tributary valley? Well, there's no, but now the tributary valley is just draining into the main valley. It's not damming up against the ice that's occupying that valley. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we've kind of seen this process playing out on a mini scale during the last 100, 150 years. And we also see that the volume and intensity of these Yokolops or, or, or proglacial outburst floods seems to be diminishing because of the shrinking ice. So what they've said is, well, because, you, you know, they've said that the volume of water has been diminishing. We're, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here um, because we're going to dive into the, to, into the Missoula floods and channel scab lands in, in detail upcoming soon, um, especially when we're, we've already, uh, Professor Jerome Lessman of the um, Vancouver Island University has agreed to be on the show. So he's going to be on uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. And we're going to talk drumlins and some other things because he is, I, I would say he probably wouldn't, you know, he's too a humble guy, but I would say he's probably one of the world's foremost experts on drumlins who is actively researching and studying drumlins at, the, at present. I think drumlins are a very important and critical key to deciphering all of this stuff that we're talking about here. So we're going to get into drumlins and people are going to learn a lot about drumlins along with, because that's part of this vocabulary of hydraulic catastrophes that we're going to be learning about. So, um, so underfit streams, that's part of the vocabulary. And what people don't realize is that most of the river valleys in North America are, are underfit. Most of the modern rivers are occupying huge channels that were created by enormously augmented flows. 